Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're taking a deeper look at the very strong jobs report that was released last week for the month of January. After months of relatively strong but declining employment growth, January shocked the investment world with over 517,000 new jobs being reported by the U.S. Bureau of Labor and Statistics. The report was at odds with the daily reports of layoffs that we are seeing in multiple industries across the nation. So why do we even care about this? After all, we're real estate investors. Well, the Federal Reserve is setting interest rate policy in large part to cool the jobs market so that we don't experience a 1970s style wage price spiral. Since interest costs are front and center for us real estate investors, the employment numbers could be a leading indicator of what the Fed might do with interest rate policy based on employment statistics. Now, the press have a bad habit of focusing only on one of the two surveys that are conducted on a monthly basis. The household survey tells a very different story than the employment report. It's a little bit like selective truth. The employment report is not the whole truth. It's a half truth. The other half of the truth is the household survey, which continues to show falling workforce participation. The narrative is that a strong jobs market will put too much negotiating leverage in the hands of employees, and that will ultimately fuel a wage price spiral. So the question is... What could be behind this incredibly strong employment report? It doesn't make any sense. Who is hiring right now? I mean, half a million jobs filled in the month of January. That's not a typical scenario. You'll often see layoffs following Q4. A lot of retail jobs disappear after the Christmas season. Where do these half a million jobs come from? So let's take a look and see if these jobs are in fact really being filled. The other obvious comparison is to look at the income tax filing data and compare it to the employment report. If people are filing their tax returns, which they're required to do, then those who are in the workforce should also show up in the employment report and the IRS data should match the data from the employment report pretty much perfectly. So the question is whether the government, do they even make that comparison? And if they do, what do the numbers tell us? Well, it turns out that every year they do make that comparison in the month of March and they compare it to the state filings. And if there are discrepancies, they'll make a correction. Well, the revisions for the latest benchmark numbers have in fact been incorporated into the latest report, and the numbers are updated also for the year 2021 and 2022. That was just done in the January report. These revised numbers are up by half a million employees for fiscal year 2021. In the numbers for 2022, we saw the preliminary numbers at 4.5 million jobs created, and then the final numbers at 4.81 million. That's a discrepancy of 300,000 new jobs created for 2022. And it looks like they bumped up the monthly numbers for each month to correspond to that delta. The other adjustment that they make is for population. It looks like the Bureau of Labor and Statistics did not take actual population growth into account over the past year, and they need to make an adjustment. Lacking any precise data on these new immigrants, they imputed the numbers based on an assumption. Rather than spread the statistics uniformly throughout the year, they lump the adjustment into the month of January. So the numbers for January are not really a reflection of hiring that actually took place. January's numbers are a result of a change in measurement. The household survey is telling a dramatically different story. We can't compare these two numbers. And then when you overlay on top of that the population control factor that they've introduced to adjust for the mistaken population, the census is showing that there is more population in the nation than they previously thought. In fact, the civilian population shows there are 871,000 more people in the nation than they thought. And without the population control factor in the numbers, the actual number of monthly new jobs in January was only 84,000 when you exclude that population control factor. What they did is they took the population control factor and made an assumption that because most of those people were of working age, that the vast majority of them had jobs. We also want to look at the household survey and the employment survey. If the numbers are accurate, those two numbers should be relatively in sync with one another. So for 2021, the household survey showed 6.12 million jobs were created in the year. The employment report showed 7.27 million. Those numbers are not matching that well, and for 2022, the number was even worse. The household survey showed 1 million jobs were created, and the employment survey shows 3.65 million. That's a very large discrepancy. When you have a discrepancy of 2.65 million jobs between the two surveys, you've got to stand up and pay attention. You can't just look at the one survey and discount the other. The other strange one is looking at average hours worked. In December of 2022, that was down to 34.3 hours on average. 
and that is consistent with what you see in a weakening economy. But in the January statistics, we see that the average hours worked jumped to 34.7 hours. That's incredibly unusual. That's only happened twice in history. The first time it happened was in May of 2020, the result of the first wave of reopening during the pandemic. And then the second was in March of 2021, the result of the deep freeze in Texas in the month of February. And the reopening of things in March caused a jump in average hours worked. Now, I'm not saying the books are being cooked here, but the benchmark changes need to be taken into account when you're looking at the data and when you're drawing conclusions about the economy. Selective use of the data to support a particular narrative is the very definition of confirmation bias. In confirmation bias, you form a thesis and then you go out looking for the data to support your thesis. But in the scientific method, you simply analyze all of the data and you draw conclusions based on what the data is telling you. So will the Fed look at the headline number, plug it into their models, assume the jobs market is super strong, and push further with the wage price spiral inflation narrative? Or will the Fed want to take further steps to understand what the numbers are really telling them? Will confirmation bias come into the picture? And if so, will the Fed be working on trying to fix a problem that doesn't really exist? I can't think of anything more insane than fixing a problem that doesn't exist simply because you're looking at the wrong data, or in this case, failing to understand what the data is actually telling you. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.